Chapter 4, The New Candidate November faded into December, and they hadn't heard much about the Yule Ball from Hagrid. Thanks to the Fick Po, rumors began to spread about the event. Most people were assuming the ball would take place on Christmas Day or around it because of its name. It was also assumed that it would be in the cafeteria because it was the only suitable venue for a dance. Harry's campaign was going well. Unfortunately, Malfoy had a lot of voters, and they wouldn't even come to Harry's speeches. It did make sense, most of Harry's voters wouldn't go to any of Malfoy's speeches. Ron claimed to be working on something that would help with that, and he'd been disappearing even more often. Harry took the podium to make his scheduled speech. The crowd eagerly waited. Hello, Hogwarts. Today I will talk about an important topic that is very personal to me. The larcenies that have plagued Hogwarts since before I even arrived here are getting out of hand. Mark my words, I will stop them. The crowd roared and the journalists scribbled in their notepads. My dear pet rock was stolen on my first night here. Several students gave various sounds of sympathy and Harry went on. I was just a first year then and I didn't know my way around the castle, but with my friends we turned the campus upside down and found the one who stole my pet. I, of course, let him off with a warning, since I could tell he would turn his life around. Who likes second chances? The crowd cheered. I love second chances. No matter how many candy cars you've robbed, I believe you can change. Ron laughed and Hermione rolled her eyes. No matter how many bags of drugs you've inhaled, I believe you can change. The students cheered louder than ever before. Among the applause, Ron said something. Hey, he's right. I quit drugs. What? Hermione asked in disbelief. This concludes my speech, goodbye, Harry said quickly before jumping off the stage towards Ron. Are you serious? Yeah, Ron answered. Yesterday, while I was counting my money, I realized hindering my abilities with drugs to avoid trying and failing was stupid. Good for you, Harry exclaimed. Congrats, this is really awesome, Hermione beamed. My belief was that I could blame my failures on drugs, but now I see I could never fail. Because as long as you're trying, you won't be a failure, Harry asked. No, because I can make amazing maple syrup. Ron reached into his pocket and took out two unmarked packets. Try this. Harry and Hermione did as they were instructed and tasted the best maple syrup they had ever had. It was really sweet and the maple was strong. They could tell it would be even better on pancakes or waffles. Or poutine. This is incredible, Hermione exclaimed. How'd you make this? Harry asked. I'm Canadian. It's in my blood. My great-grandfather, Billius, had some unfinished maple syrup research. I continued it, and with help with my maple trees from Professor Sprout and help with my recipe from Professor Snape, I created this. See, the problem with stuff around here is that it doesn't have actual maple in it. Can you believe that? He again reached into his pocket. This time he took out a folded nutrition label. You'd think you'd see maple in the ingredients, right? Right, Harry replied. Well, look. Mostly sugar and water. The only maple is in the 2% or less section. 2%! 2! Two. Hermione looked revolted. But it's maple syrup! How could they get away with calling it maple syrup if there isn't any maple in it? Apparently, 2% or less counts. In some syrups, maple is completely non-existent. Of course, they put it in with the other maple syrups because it's called pancake syrup. It's just lies! I would never let my company perform such trickery and deception. A loud sound gained their attention. The three whipped their heads around to find the source of the noise and saw someone familiar standing at the podium. Neville Longbottom? Harry shouted. Where did you get a gavel? Ron asked. Now that I have your attention, I have an announcement. I will be running for King of Hogwarts. Why? Harry asked. I speak for the silent background characters. You know how many lines I had in the first book? None. What are you talking about? Hermione asked. The forgotten boys and girls of Hogwarts. The silent majority. Neville rose his hands above his head and gave a double peace sign. Who long have we been a second-class citizen to the main characters? What do they have that we don't? Woody one-liners and character arts? If we were given the basic right of dialogue, we'd be popular among readers as well. Vote for me and never be an unidentified Hogwarts student ever again. Too bad the unnamed background characters don't get a vote, Ron commented. Neville stepped down from the podium and the crowd started to separate. Harry, Hermione, and Ron walked back to the castle. Now there are three candidates, Harry sighed. No problem, Ron started. We just need to get more votes. Maybe we could help the students with some kind of problem? Like what? Hermione asked. A Gryffindor ran down the hallway. The students are disappearing! The students are disappearing! That was convenient, Harry said. Oi, Ron called. Get back here. What? The Gryffindor asked. Go on, Hermione said, motioning with her hand. You were saying something about students disappearing? All right. Yeah. Which student, citizen? From where? How long have they been missing? Enlighten us of the details. I may have been overemphasizing the situation. Hermione put a palm to her forehead. Oh, 
my gosh, she moaned. Why does everyone at this school have to be so annoying and stupid? Seriously, everyone here is such a complete and utter loser, it's not even funny. So what is the actual situation? Harry asked. I was holding a meeting in the library. I was set up on a stage, discussing some things, and I learned we all share a common... He mumbled a few words. Fear makes me sound weak. We share a common concern for the well-being of the school. The library doesn't have a stage, Ron said. And why would there be a conference at the library? It's supposed to be quiet. Oh my gosh, he keeps lying, Hermione complained. Hermione, pull yourself together, Ron demanded. Harry and I aren't supposed to be the straight man. That's your job. Shut up, Ron. I'm tired of being the straight man right now. For once, can I just punch this guy out? You two never let me viciously attack anyone. Harry, what do we do? She's turning into McGonagall. She's acting completely out of character. Nah, she's acting pretty much in her character, Harry said. She's always been violent. Mud, do what you need to do. Hermione grabbed the student by the collar. All right, you listen here. Tell me what situation you're all upset about. No funny business. Okay, okay, I was in the library with some friends and we were talking about the Death Eaters. They're on everyone's mind. Very good. Mud, put him down. Hermione pouted but released him. See, Ron, Mud is like a cat. Sometimes they just really need to destroy something. You give them a scratching post, or in this case a student, and boom, they're back to normal. Harry addressed the student. What is your name, dear citizen? Path Mendax. I'm a fifth year. Well, Path, have no fear. I will fix the minor inconvenience that is the Death Eaters. Harry began walking down the hall. Ron, Mud, let's roll. They followed him to Dumbledore's office. Upon entering the round room, they saw him reading a newspaper. There is my future colleagues. How are you, Dumble? Harry glanced at the newspaper. You read the Fictum Post, too? Ah, it's a great source of news, Dumbledore answered. As fellow student protectors, Harry began, we should discuss the Death Eaters. Dumbledore stared at him with concern. Harry, you realize you haven't yet won the election. Answer the question, Harry demanded. What are we going to do about the Death Eaters? Yeah, Ron exclaimed. Guys, calm down, Hermione nagged. Give the poor guy a break. He's like 100. I'm 60. Right, 60, whatever. The point is, he's super old. 60 years old with this dreadful job? I pity the man. Dealing with these stupid children every day? It's awful. Ron and Harry became distracted by Fox waving around a shiny spoon. Well, it's not all that bad, said Dumbledore. I mostly leave the children to the professors. Actually, Miss Granger, there's a secret hatch just below the rug over there. It leads to a secret tunnel. And where does that lead? Hermione asked. Headmaster's secret. Dumbledore smiled with a gleam in his eye. Hermione walked across the room and took the spoon from Fox. Harry then remembered what they were there for. Death Eaters! Oh, don't worry about them. They're as harmful as the boogeyman. What? Ron asked along with similar questions from his friends. Dumbledore leaned back in his chair. They're not really the Death Eaters. They're fake. I've tried telling people the truth, but they won't listen. I'm confused, Hermione admitted. Take a seat, Dumbledore instructed. It's story time. The three looked behind them and noticed seating for them. Were these chairs here before? Ron asked. Yes, now sit down. He began his story as they heeded his directions. Once upon a time, there was a group of masked men. They enjoyed inflicting fear on innocent civilians. Dear citizens, Harry interrupted. That's right, dear citizens. Then an evil man, a powerful evil man, decided he wanted to take credit for the actions of the group. He wanted to be feared, just like the group. He became their unofficial leader. They didn't need a leader, but they thought he made them more frightening. It was a symbiotic relationship, neither party was controlling the other. Time passed and the leader disappeared, the group later disbanded. Now, however, I fear the leader is back. This is so sad, Harry sighed. Alexa, play dis- Oh wait, it's the 90s. He's trying to bring the group back together, but most of them have left that life behind. This new imposter group he's making keeps the old name, the Death Eaters. Thankfully, the new members are as dense as they come. Their raids hail spray cheese, not bullets. The door opened and Hagrid entered with a large box that hid his face. Harry's got another package. How do you want to get rid of the Dursleys this time? Hagrid put the box on the floor and held it at umbrella point. Why do you have an umbrella? Ron asked. Ah, uh, it's raining now. Why else would I have an umbrella? It's not raining, we were just outside, Hermione said. It must have just started. Take a look, Dumbledore instructed as he opened the curtains. Outside the window were dark clouds and a heavy downpour. He walked away from the window and towards the package. I don't hear any cackling this time. 
Maybe it's not the Dursleys, then, Hagrid suggested. What's going on? Harry asked. Your aunt and uncle have been hiding in packages in an effort to get to you, Dumbledore answered. Sometimes they send explosives. I've had to train Fang to be a bomb-sniffing dog. Stand back, Hagrid said as he started to open the box. He pulled the duct tape off the box and then ripped the folds open. He looked down into the box and saw a lot of bubble wrap, but no sign of the Dursleys. Someone sent you a TV? Soon they were channel surfing in Harry and Ron's dormitory. Several students arrived to see the brand new television. Who's it from? George asked. I actually never checked. Harry answered as he began to look through the things that arrived with the package. He found a letter and opened it. Dear Harry, we've been searching, but we haven't found the rat yet. I heard about the Death Eater attack and I wanted you to be careful. Anyway, enjoy the TV. Uncle Sirius. It's from my uncle, Harry answered contently. What is this? Ron asked as he looked at the TV. The screen showed a familiar journalist standing in front of Hogwarts Castle. They held a microphone with a Fictum Post logo and talked to the audience. There was a headline on the bottom of the screen and another logo on either side. We know that many students have had concerns for the alleged house elves working in the kitchen. Our teams have done extensive research and found the rumors to not be true. We've gotten a statement from Professor Albus Dumbledore, headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, confirming there are and never have been any house elves working in or around the kitchen, the reporter said. How did they get their own channel? Hermione asked with her eyes wide. The scene changed to another reporter who was indoors. They sat at a desk and had many notes. They have their own set, Harry said in disbelief. They watched the channel in shock until it went off the air for the night. When it did, the group in Harry and Ron's dormitory left. Hermione also left to go sleep. Harry woke up the next morning and got dressed. It didn't take long for him to realize what was missing. The outlet was missing a plug that had been there the night before. The TV was gone. Ron, Harry called. Wake up! We've been robbed! Ron slowly woke up and got out of bed. What is it? He asked while rubbing his eyes. The TV is gone! What? Ron looked at the vacant spot that the TV had once filled. One of their roommates was thoroughly irked by the loud noises that woke him up. He got out of bed and walked to his trunk. Harry became very suspicious of him. What are you doing in our dormitory, Neville? I can't believe you haven't noticed by now. This is the dormitory I was assigned to. We've been roommates for three years. I think I would have remembered you, Ron said as he shook his head. Me too, Harry agreed. I'm very observant. Do you know where the TV is? Did you by any chance steal it? Ron asked. You have suspiciously snuck into our dormitory. If I did, where would I put it? Where would I hide a stolen television? Wouldn't it be beneficial to keep it in here where I could actually watch it when you weren't here? I don't think he did it, Harry whispered. I don't think so either, Ron agreed. You might want to quit your campaign so we know for sure, Harry suggested. Neville looked at him coldly and didn't say another word. Ron and Harry walked out of the room, but Harry had forgotten his recycling textbook. When they entered their dormitory, they found Neville holding Harry's pillow. What are you doing? Harry asked. Nothing, Neville answered as he threw the pillow back onto Harry's bed. Harry went to his pillow and examined it. After a few tense seconds, he pulled out a tiny black box labeled The Gatewater Dirt Getter 8002. Harry closed his palm over the listening device. This means war. Were you trying to start some sort of snoring scandal? Ron asked. W wh what No. Of, of course not. Ron rolled his eyes before leaving the room once more. They met Hermione in the common room and told her about Neville's spy attempt. After they laughed about it for a while, they told her about the robbery. She seemed really disappointed, even though Harry didn't think she cared for the TV that much. Over the next few days, they hadn't heard anything about the TV and started to forget about it. A week later, Hagrid sent a letter to Harry, Hermione, and Ron. Pickwitch and delivered it and did some kind of letter dance before dropping it on Ron's head. He opened the letter and read it aloud. Hi everyone, if you're still interested, I'd appreciate some help with the Yule Ball. If you could help decorate the cafeteria the night before, that would be great. The ball will be on Christmas Day, by the way. I'll have the decorations in the cafeteria on the 24th. Thanks, Hagrid. On the 24th of December, they finished dinner and started to decorate. They found several boxes and a list in the corner of the room. The list described how the cafeteria should be decorated in great detail. 1. Move the regular tables to the hall. I will take them elsewhere so they are out of sight on the night of the Yule Ball. 2. The tablecloths over the formal tables must not have any wrinkles or stains. 3. Each centerpiece must have four yellow roses and exactly five centimeters of water in each vase. 4. Put out plates and napkins at every spot, but do not leave a single utensil in the cafeteria. Okay, let's handle these first four things and then go on, Hermione suggested. This list is double-sided, Harry said. And some of these things are really weird, Ron added. What are the guests going to eat with? Their hands? This is supposed to be formal. 
It's for Hagrid, Hermione said thoughtfully. I'm sure it makes perfect sense to him. They tackled each item and the cafeteria looked amazing once they were done. Pigwishin had hung a lot of ribbons and streamers and Hedwig followed, making sure they were secure. Crookshanks dusted the tables that had been in storage for four years, which made Hermione decide that he desperately needs a bath. Hagrid looked busier than ever. Fang followed him around as he examined the decorations. He was very pleased with the work and thanked them for their help. On their way back to Gryffindor Tower, they decided to pay Moni Joanne a visit, as they hadn't seen her in a while. They walked down the hallway and noticed the door was locked. From inside the bathroom, they heard several muffled voices. They knocked, but they weren't answered. After waiting for a few minutes, they decided to leave. The next day began like no other Christmas day at Hogwarts. Very few people went home to visit family because of the Yule Ball. Not even Harry, Ron, or Hermione knew anything about it, and they helped decorate. The Fickpo was confident they were correct about their rumors. Breakfast was served in each common room since the cafeteria was in pre-event mode. This only made the gossip worse. Students were getting dressed up for a dance and even started asking to go with another person. Harry ate some waffles with Ron and Hermione as they washed the chaos around them. Hedwig brought a letter to Harry that unleashed even more chaos. Dear Harry, I hope you remember me. I'm Cho Chang. We met during a Quidditch game a few months ago. I'd like to meet with you again just outside of Gryffindor Tower. See you then, Cho. Harry put the letter down. Do you think she's mad that I never fixed the larceny problem? Just in case we should go with you, Ron said. They left the common room and found Cho just where she said she'd be. Hi, she greeted. Harry, I was wondering if you'd like to go to the Yule Ball with me? Oh, uh, Harry started. I'm actually kind of with someone else right now. Cho turned bright red. Oh, sorry. She quickly walked away and Harry turned around to see Ron and Hermione's curious faces. You are? Ron asked skeptically. Well, that's kind of personal, Harry replied. Yeah, but we're your best friends, Hermione reminded. You have to tell us. Harry darted down the hall. A large group of people grew outside the cafeteria. They either wore a fancy dress or a fancy suit. Harry, along with Hermione and Ron, were skeptical of the event. They hadn't received any details and no one was invited. Hagrid walked towards the crowd with Fang and instructed everyone to make a path to the door. He was wearing a black bow tie and a formal suit. He was just about to exit the castle through the main doors, but he turned to look at everyone. You really do pay attention to me classes. Huh? Ron said as Hagrid went outside. He returned a few minutes later with a line of seven large animals. He led them to the cafeteria and they sat down on the seats. They're Yules, Harry shouted. Remember Hagrid's first lesson of the year? He told us about Yules. This is the Yule Ball. It's for the Yules. It has nothing to do with Christmas. Wait, so Hagrid throws a ball every four years for a bunch of Yules? Hermione concluded. It seems that way, Ron responded. They watched the Yules dip their paws into their food instead of using any utensils. This is the weirdest thing I have ever seen, Hermione said as some of the Yules left the table to start dancing to the music. The crowd of people that were expecting a ball looked incredibly sad. I've got an idea, Harry said before he walked to Hagrid. Hagrid, do you think it would bother the Yules if we joined them? They'd love that. Just make sure you wear a bow tie, Hagrid said as he looked at Harry's casual clothes. Harry walked back to the hallway and made an announcement. As I'm sure you all know, I'm Harry Potter, protector of Hogwarts. The Harry Potter campaign has helped decorate, and we have gotten an invitation to everyone wearing fancy clothes. The crowd cheered and entered the cafeteria. Ron, Harry, and Hermione entered the room and borrowed some bow ties from Hagrid. Why do you throw a ball for the Yules? Ron asked as he took a black bow tie from the large bin. They're very classy animals, Hagrid answered. They get upset if they go too long without a fancy ball, and no one wants angry Yules. What are they exactly? Hermione asked as she stared at the strange animals. Hagrid chuckled. Part yak, part horse, part donkey, and part penguin. Oh, of course, Harry said as if it made sense. Well, I better go and mingle with the guests, Hagrid said before walking to the biggest Yule. They started walking around the room, taking in the strange sights, and Hermione noticed Ron carrying something odd. Is that a rope? Yep. Ron faced Harry and looked at him seriously. Lassos. Easiest way to get a date. He started waving the lasso above his head. Hermione slowly shook her head and pulled his arm down. They kept walking and saw Pigwidgeon flying around the buffet table. He kept landing on the table and then shooting back into the air. Before they could pick him up and attempt to calm him down, he landed in the punch bowl. He looked below at the red liquid and was filled with regret. After a moment, he started to realize he had his own pool and began to splash around. The Yules looked at him with absolute disgust. Ron picked him out of the bowl and carried him to the hall. Pigwidgeon started flying around, trying to get the punch off of him, and he bumped into Neville, who was listening to his earpiece. He glowered at them and left the hall. By the end of the evening, the students and the seven Yules were still scattered around the room. 
Hermione, Ron, and Harry walked around and watched the bizarre scene continue. When the ball ended, they were sure the Yules really enjoyed themselves. The students got the ball they had assumed would happen, and Harry's polls skyrocketed. The 1st of January arrived and everyone was excited to hear who would be competing in the Triwizard Tournament. Harry's campaign was riding on this. He had the majority of the voters on his side, but another scandal could erase all of his progress. He needed everyone to believe he would never do anything wrong. Then, any rumors would be brushed off. The long tables in the cafeteria were back and Argus Filch was still cleaning up from the Yule Ball. Students piled into the room and sat with their houses. The energetic chatter of everyone filled the room as Filch walked down the rows mopping the floor. Filthy animals, he mumbled. This is the fifth time I mopped this floor and I can still smell the putrid odor. He put the mop back into the rolling bucket of cleaning solution. Phineas doesn't have to deal with gamekeepers bringing in disgusting animals. He works for a clean mare and dusts the already spotless manor, Filch said as he dropped the drenched mop onto the floor with a splat. Phineas is so perfect, he mocked. Argus, why don't you be more like your brother? He moved the mop across the floor erratically and missed a bunch of spots. Stupid parents. He stopped abruptly and looked beside him. He stared at Harry. I hate children. He went back to his mopping and walked away. Dumbledore walked in front of the tables and began speaking. If I could have your attention. The students stopped talking at once. Thank you. I have the box that will tell us who is going to compete in the Triwizard Tournament. Everyone gave a round of applause. If I say your name, please come stand over here. The first name is... He picked a piece of paper out of the box. Fleur Delacour, our exchange student from France. She pompously walked to the front of the room. The next name is... Victor Crumb, our other foreign exchange student who is from Bulgaria. Victor haughtily stood next to Fleur. The final name is... Cedric Diggory, our foreign exchange student from Canada? The students started talking again. Three foreign exchange students were picked. Harry heard some people start coming up with the conspiracy theories. We're all foreign exchange students and we just don't know it, Fred suggested. Students, please, settle down, Dumbledore insisted. These students are guests at our school. We cannot have a foreign exchange student death match. Why not? Professor McGonagall interrupted. I will pick another name, Dumbledore announced. The final name is... With his hands together, he looked up to the ceiling and muttered something. Then he timidly reached into the box and picked out a new name. Harry Potter. Harry Potter? He's only 14. I don't think he is, Professor, Mad-Eye Moody exclaimed. I know for a full fact he's 17. He winked at Harry. Who is that man? Dumbledore asked. He's the one safety teacher, Snape answered. No, he's not, Dumbledore stated. I've never seen him before in my life, let alone hire him to teach children. Mad-Eye Moody ran off, laughing hysterically. Maybe we should pick another name, Snape suggested as Darthwing began to doze off. Dumbledore shook his head. No, no, that won't be necessary. We still have another foreign exchange student who might be in that box. People are making enough theories about me as it is. Harry proudly walked to the front of the room. Now all he has to do is win. Malfoy's polls were at an all-time low. Harry, on the other hand, was doing great. On top of Harry's loyal supporters, the Yule Ball, and the Triwizard Tournament, he's been speaking snack to Slytherin students. He thinks he'll be able to relate better if he speaks their native tongue. The entire idea was mad, but somehow it was working. Harry almost had all the votes of the Slytherins.